Nobel, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics goes to a discovery that shook the world. That's their words, not mine. And I want to say, what I want to tell you about is, I, it is true, it's a discovery that literally and figuratively shook the world. And so I want to unpack a little bit about that. Uh, the three men who were honored in this discovery was uh, Ray Weiss, who was my PhD advisor um, uh, at MIT, um, Barry Barish, who was my postdoc advisor, and Kip Horn, who I've worked with for many years, these uh, observations. So if you don't remember anything about, else about my talk, you should remember we found nature's gold mine. <laughs> so, a quick introduction. Dr. Mubalwala is a Pakistani-American astrophysicist at MIT. Uh, she's a Lahori by birth, but a Karachi Wali by formative <laughs> Hello. And then she moved to U.S. to learn and do phenomenal things in science. To do phenomenal things in science. Dr. Mavalwala is best known for her work on the detection of gravitational waves in the, and I hope I get this right, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory Project, for which the team and LIGO founders were awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. When I first read about this project on, and Dr. Mavalwala's contributions, I thought to myself, a Pakistani woman just helped prove that Einstein was right all along. Wow. I could not be more proud, so without further ado, it is my pleasure and on my honor to bring on stage Dr. Nurjas Mawalwala. Please give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, for being here. That's a very generous introduction. Um, I'm a scientist, I like to do science, and I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about the science that I was uh, uh, involved in. Um, this talk is really just to sort of set the stage for what was done. And I was one of many hundreds that was part of this. Uh, I've been doing it since I was a graduate student, so for about 25 years of my life. And so I'll, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of what we did, and a little bit about the science of what was, uh, what was done, okay? So uh, in October this year, uh, October 2017, this was the announcement. And the announcement began with, from the Swedish Academy, which gives out the Nobel Prize, that the, Nobel, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics goes to a discovery that shook the world. That's their words, not mine. And I want to say, what I want to tell you about is, I, it is true, it's a discovery that literally and figuratively shook the world. And so I want to unpack a little bit about that. Uh, the three men who were honored in this discovery was uh, Ray Weiss, who was my PhD advisor um, uh, at MIT, um, Barry Barish, who was my postdoc advisor, and Kip Horn, who I've worked with for many years. Um, and so you can see that the, the path of science, it really matters who you encounter, because I encountered these amazing men, and, and uh, along the way uh, became a, a somewhat decent scientist through their uh, training and efforts. Okay, so what was the, the big deal here? So you can see what it was for. It's the word, say, for decisive con contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. So there's many things here you probably are wondering what the hell does this mean? What's LIGO? What are gravitational waves? We're going to get there. Okay? So um, Einstein told us something very unusual about the universe. We all know about gravity. Kids, do you know about gravity? Everybody knows about gravity. When you jump up, why do you come back down? Gravity. gravity. So we, we thought we knew about gravity, and then Einstein said that it's all wrong. Our ideas about gravity as a force, of attraction, is just wrong. The reason why gravity works is because all heavy things cause empty space to curve. So what does that mean? So imagine for a moment that we had a trampoline. All kids have probably jumped on trampolines before. What if you put a bowling ball in the center of the trampoline? What happens to it? It curves. It kind of makes a dimple. Now, what if you put a little plain marble at the edge of the trampoline? What happens to that plain marble? It falls into the bowling ball. That was Einstein's idea of gravity, that it isn't some mysterious force. It's actually curvature of space that causes things to attract. Then, and that was fine. That was revolutionary enough. But then he had this other thought. He was like, well, what if we take this bowling ball on our trampoline, and what if we bounce it up and down? Then what does space do? 
And then to his horror, out of his equations and out of the math that he did, came something called a gravitational wave. And it's very much like if you dropped a rock on the surface of a pond. What if you dropped a rock on the surface of a pond? What happens? Ripples. So space does that too. So if you take this star, this happens to be our sun and a little earth here, and in fact, if you started to bounce it up and down, space-time would start to look like this. Ripples that uh, travel outwards from wherever the object is. And in this particular case, I've drawn these two uh, stars. They're sort of, they could be ordinary stars like our sun. Um, in the case of the discoveries that I'm going to tell you about, they're not ordinary stars like our sun. Now, stars, like many other things, come in, in many different species. Um, you know, everybody has seen that, you know, let's take an example, dogs. You know, you have dogs that are chihuahuas and you have dogs that are huskies. And stars are the same way. There are big stars, little stars, hot stars, cold stars. And most importantly, there are stars that are made of different materials. And in particular, this pair of stars that I've shown you, this is just an artist's picture, but eventually I'll show you the real thing. These are called neutron stars. And these occur when stars like our own sun die. So does anyone know that all stars die eventually? Yeah. If you didn't know that, it's true. Even our sun will do that, but not for five billion years. So we are okay. But when, those, when stars die, they do one of two things. They either form a neutron star or they form a black hole. Now, who knows what a black hole is? Oh, I knew your kids would all, all know what black holes are. So black holes are stars that have so, so much gravity that even light can't escape. And when you don't have light in the space, what do you have? Darkness, and darkness is black. And therefore, they're called black holes, okay? And now, a remarkable thing about Einstein, these, all of these ideas came from his, his theory, including gravitational waves. He did not like black holes. He thought nature would never be so crazy as to make black holes. And black holes, indeed, were not discovered until he had died. So Einstein thought these gravitational waves were either a mistake or just some peculiarity of the math that he did, but not something that nature would do. Yet, a hundred years later, we discovered them. But that journey didn't happen recently. The, the quest to discover these waves started about 40 years ago. So let me tell you a little bit about how that happened. But before I do that, I want to fast forward to about 10 years ago. Now, part of the reason that it's taken so long from the time Einstein told us these waves are out there to being able to detect them is that Einstein's own math is really, really horribly messy. And we didn't know how to solve that. And to solve it, we needed supercomputers. So about 10 years ago, the first solutions came, which asked a simple question. What happens when two black holes orbit each other? Now, everybody knows about orbits. I think we're going to ask questions at the end. If you remember your question, okay? So, all star uh, objects that orbit, orbit each other. We know, everyone knows that the Earth orbits the Sun. But the Earth is not going to crash into the Sun in the lifetime of the solar system. The Earth just closes on its own orbit each time. Turns out when black holes or neutron stars orbit each other, they crash into each other. And they do that because they're radiating these gravitational waves, and that energy that the waves carry away comes from the orbit. So they crash into each other. So this was the question asked. What happens when two black holes orbit each other? And here's a movie that was solved using Einstein's math and supercomputers. And two things I want you to pay attention to. The one is this part right here. You'll see this little signal that's accumulating. It just looks like a series of, of, of bumps and wiggles at the bottom. And on the movie on the top, what you'll see is actually what happens to space itself. Believe me, you'll be very glad this happens very far away from us. Okay. So, let's take a look. So here we go. These are two black holes. And now, just that now we're used to thinking about the fact that around the black hole, space is very curved. And in fact, you see these funnels under the black holes. And the black holes are just going around e each other. What you see in, in, the, in the shape of the surface is the shape of space itself which means the shape of our trampoline, nature's trampoline. And what you see at the, uh, in the colors is the, the rate of flow of time. It turns out this is something that, that most people don't know. When you go too close to a black hole, your clocks start ticking more slowly. Things, time slows down. But you see how much space is getting distorted over here? And in fact, when the two black holes touch, when, they, when their, their, their surfaces touch, 
you'll see enormous mountains of distortion in space-time. And in fact, if real objects were anywhere near here, we'd be ripped apart to shreds. Okay? So that's what happens, and now this pink and blue colors are the waves that travel outwards. Now, in no way would our planet ever do that with the, with, with the sun. But this is the, a place where nature is very peculiar. Black holes and neutron stars do that. And this, as you can see, is a huge collaboration of 30 years of making these solutions. So that was the first ingredient needed for the discovery, knowing how to solve the math. Then comes the next two important ingredients. And that comes from, the first one comes from Kip Horn. Kip, uh, one of the Nobel laureates, was a professor at Caltech. And in the 1960s already, he was asking the question, what does the gravitational wave look like? And he was among the first people not only to say, well, this is what space-time would do. So this picture is very, very uh, uh, fun. Time is running on this axis. It simply says, and strain is just what is the size of the gravitational wave. This is what space-time is doing. It, at, at one part of the cycle, it distorts space upwards, downwards, upwards, out, downwards. But it grows in time. You can see this is growing. And it also gets faster. And the process is quite simple to, uh, to see. What's happening is it's just these two stars. They start off far from each other. And then as they get closer and closer, they go faster and faster until they crash. And that's what he's showing there. And the, the crash is this point right here. So that was the, the first thing. But the most important thing that Thorne did and, and uh, that, uh, you know, was he put a scale on this. He said that the size of the wave should be a part in 10 to the minus 21. Now, for most of us who are not scientists, especially for kids who are not yet, who have not yet got to this kind of notation, the only thing you should know is this is an awfully, awfully, awfully small number. It's teeny tiny. And once I put a scale on it and really how small it is, you'll see that it is just uh, mind boggling. So let me put a scale on it. So the next part of the puzzle came from Ray Weiss, who was at, in, in, at MIT, also in the 1960s. Now, Ray asked a different question. Kip asked the question, what does a gravitational wave signal look like? Ray asked the question, you know, if nature is really making gravitational waves, we should be able to measure them here on the Earth, damn it, and we will. And so he asked, how could you do that? And to answer that question, you have to ask, what does a gravitational wave do here to us? So now comes a fun part. Let me tell you what it does here to us. If a gravitational wave from somewhere out in a black hole far away comes right here through, say, me, it, what it does is it shrinks and stretches me. And you say, well, what does that mean? So let me show you. This is called the gravitational wave dance, which you kids can try later. But here's what it does. Basically, as the gravitational wave comes through me, if I'm across like this, it, it will squish me in, in one direction and stretch me in the other. So you can see I squish and stretch and squish and stretch. As it goes through me, each part of the, the, the wave cycle squishes and stretches. It does that to all of us, it does that to the Earth, it does that to empty space, it does that to anything it passes through. And as soon as Weiss understood that, he said, then we know how to make a measurement. And this is what the measurement was that he proposed. He said, take a laser, and that's an important historical piece. So a laser was invented in 1960, so again, the invention of the laser allowed this technology to become available. He said, take a laser beam, shoot it along two directions, bounce it off two mirrors, and then make a measurement of the laser beam coming back. If a gravitational wave comes by and moves these two mirrors in the way that I did with my dance, you will either see lots of light or no light at the output here. And literally by measuring how much light you see, you can tell if a gravitational wave came by. And that was what his idea was. Now, he understood one other thing very importantly. He knew that you couldn't make this very short. So let me tell you why. When the gravitational wave goes through me, with Kip Thorne's calculation that it would, of its size being 10 to the minus 21, it would change. I'm an object of about length 1 meter, 1.6 to be exact. Um, it would change my, my height by 10 to the minus 18 meters. And let me tell you what that means. That's a thousand times smaller than a single nucleus of an atom, which is 10,000 times smaller than a single atom, which is 10,000 times smaller than a hair. So you can see how tiny it was. 
So why is that? Well, it's impossible to do this with meter scale stuff. You can't do this with things that you can just build in a small laboratory. He said you have to make this long. And how long? He said you have to make it two and a half miles long, or 4,000 meters, four kilometers long. And then, with this wave having a size, this 10 to the minus 21, the size of the wave is given to us by nature. That's what black holes and neutron stars do. The length of the detector, we can control. And so we did. He proposed a four kilometer long detector, in which case what he was proposing is to measure motions of these mirrors that are at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is a thousand times smaller than a proton. And he said, oh, well, that's a piece of cake. We're going to do it. And so in 1960, Eight, he had this idea, he and Thorne got together, and they proposed to build this experiment. And the experiment came about over the next 30 years. In fact, you see now these aerial views of these L-shaped objects, one in Washington State, one in Louisiana. It's called LIGO, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And in case you didn't notice, I'm wearing one. <laughs> you can ask, well, how can you make such a measurement? How can you measure motion of a mirror that's a thousand times smaller than a single proton? So I'm going to tell you, there are two things you need to do, and you need to do them really, really well. But that's more or less what you need to do. The first thing is you have to make the mirrors very still, protect them from everything else that moves them, like the vibrations of the Earth. So let me ask you a question. If I just plucked a mirror down on a surface over here, does anyone have any guess for how much it would move by? Not much, but still a lot. It would move by about a millionth uh, 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 of a meter, or a thousandth of a millimeter. So a one micron is in, in, in technical speak. Now we want to make a measurement, so 10 to the minus 6 meters, we want to make a measurement that's a billion times more precise. So what do you do? You take your mirror and you put it on giant shock absorbers, like we have in our cars, that you know, the shock absorbers take away vibrations of, of, that we don't want to feel from the road. You just do it in a very sophisticated uh, way. And that gives you your first factor of a billion. You, you, do, you put your mirrors on a very uh, special shock absorbing uh, apparatus. Then the second thing you have to do is while you've made your mirror really, really still, that is, you know, good if you don't know how to measure such small distances. I'll ask one of the kids, if I asked you to measure a piece of paper, the length of a piece of paper, what would you do? You'd use a ruler. If I asked you to measure a single atom, what would you do? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're stuck. And so you have to use something. The ruler works because you have these little tick marks. Right? So you need to find something that has much, much more precise, much smaller tick marks. And it turns out that the wavelength of light has small tick marks. So we use the light as our ruler, that's what the laser does for us, and we use lots and lots of laser light, so it's a very precise ruler. And so there we use a, a, a giant laser, and we take the laser light and, and amplify it in the, in, in the device. And so that's it. So if you, if you know nothing else about how this works, you want to know we have giant shock absorbers and big lasers. Okay? And you put those two together, and you can build a detector that's de capable of measuring um, distances smaller than a thousandth of a proton. Okay? This was all funded in the, in the United States by the National Science Foundation, and our third Nobel laureate, Barry Barish, was actually not, not among the founders like Kip Horn and Ray Weisberg. He was the one who actually brought these observatories into existence. He was the director of the project uh, in this phase when it was being built up. So that was the three, the three people who were sort of credited with getting this off the ground. Now, what's the big deal? So now you know what gravitational waves are, and you know we built these detectors. Now, why would you want to measure a gravitational wave? That's another question you might ask. Well, we know that there are black holes out there, but we've never, ever directly seen one because Guess what? They're black. When you point a telescope at the black hole, you see nothing. The way to see black holes, and indeed all things that are dark, is to use their gravity. And that means gravitational waves. So that's one, at least one good reason to do it. There are many, many others that I won't go into the, the details of that scientists love and astronomers love. Okay, 
Now, this led to a global network of detectors, as many as two in the United States, in Washington and, and Louisiana. There's one in, these are four kilometers long. You can see these are all long. They have to be long to be able to make the measurement. There's a, there's a the Virgo detector in Italy that's three kilometers long. There's a three kilometer long one in, in uh, being built in Japan, or four kilometer one that's proposed to be built in India, and so on. So there is lots of these, but the two that were operating uh, first were the two US ones, the LIGO detectors. And so what did they see? So in, so this is the, the first observation of gravitational waves ever was done with this collision of black holes. Now let me just tell you how to understand these crazy names. GW stands for gravitational wave. 15 stands for the year, so 2015. Who knows what we'll do when we get into the next millennium. Uh, 09 is the month. 